If you knew nothing about the history of Catholic theology since the late 19th century and wanted a way into understanding its controversies and turmoil, there are few better places to begin than Catholic battles concerning scripture and tradition, their nature and relationship. While this is true, it also means that there is an awful lot to discuss. <coughs> All I can do this evening is to open the door a crack, enough for you to get just a sense of how much there might be to explore. Nevertheless, and this is important for my talk, this is also a wonderful and opportune time at which to examine this particular topic. Particularly on the question of scripture, we are, I hope, at a real turning point in Catholic reflection, a point at which modernity's emphases may be fruitfully joined to the Church's traditional view of the scriptural text. And it is with the nature of scripture that I will begin. However, tradition and scripture are for the Catholic theologian inseparable, and thus it will not be long before tradition makes an appearance. I think the best way to begin is for us to think about where we are now in the long history of Catholic reflection on scripture and its interpretation. The period between the late 19th century and our own day has seen the gradual taking up by Catholic scholars of the emphases of modern biblical criticism. As has become increasingly clear in recent scholarship, the idea that Catholicism was implacably opposed to the Enlightenment until the mid-20th century is largely nonsense. Catholic figures were engaged in accepting, modifying and arguing creatively with the full range of Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment figures throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. And yet, Rome itself stood deeply opposed to Catholics taking on the methods and assumptions of historical critical biblical scholarship until the very end of the 19th century. Beginning with Leo XIII's encyclical Providentissimus Deus in 1893, Leo's my favorite pope, by the way, the church came slowly to see that there were many things of value in the style of historical reconstruction that the higher criticism practiced. Vatican II's Constitution Dei Verbum, promulgated in 1965, just a few months before I was born, not sure that's of any significance, devoted to the nature and interpretation of divine revelation, seems to open the door much further. In its 12th chapter, emphasizing the importance of considering, quote, that meaning which the author intended and expressed in his particular circumstances and in his historical and cultural context. Consequent to the Council and this document, there has been a huge shift in the nature of Catholic biblical scholarship. Leaping forward to the present day, we would find that many, if not the vast majority of those teaching biblical studies in Catholic universities and seminaries, certainly in Europe and North America, are trained alongside their Protestant peers, and even if not, they participate in and are socialized into a culture of biblical investigation that is international, cross-denominational, and deeply marked by the assumption <coughs> that reconstruction of how texts were heard and understood by their composers, editors, and first hearers is simply essential to uncovering their meaning. Now, this shift has been of immense value, and yet it has also resulted in a significant diremption between those who study and teach the biblical texts and those who teach the church's doctrinal formulae. It can sometimes seem as if biblical scholars and theologians simply speak different languages, and as if both those languages are different from that that you might hear from a good pulpit. Allow me to identify two concerns, however, that reveal the promising nature of this moment now. In the first place, the picture that I have just presented of a rather monolithic biblical studies is not entirely accurate. Biblical studies has seen significant movement towards styles of reading that take seriously reception history, styles that emphasize the plurality of the interpretation of texts. And in recent years, a number of scholars have even argued quite extensively for the significance of early Christian reading 
as a drawing out of the potential of the scriptural text. It is then far more possible now than it was even 30 years ago to see how a peculiarly Catholic and theological reading of scripture might argue its place within the scholarly field. In the second place, <coughs> with Benedict XVI and Francis, we have two popes concerned to emphasize the place of scripture in the church in ways that draw out aspects of Dei Verbum too long neglected. We must then take a few moments to mention a couple of the themes that are at the heart of Vatican II's Dei Verbum and then see how they have been taught by Benedict and Francis. Doing so will take us right to the heart of what I think is a Catholic view of scripture. While it was Dei Verbum that opened the way to the rather problematic situation I've just described in modern Catholic biblical studies, this was certainly not its intention. The document, in fact, offers a remarkable balance, attempting to combine openness to new philological and historiographical techniques with strong insistence on some distinctively Catholic theological principles. And allow me to draw attention to just three. First, Dei Verbum insists that through the scripture, God addresses us. God addresses. Yes, we have the words of human writers, and yes, those words were written in particular cultural and historical contexts. But through these words, God speaks. And God speaks to us. The words are intended as the foundation of the church's faith, and are for the meditation of us all, lay or ordained, PhD or not. Second, God's revelation takes place through the word of God. But word here has a range of meaning, all of which needs to be taken in mind. Primarily, God's word is the eternal word, spoken eternally begotten eternally from the Father as word and son and image. All things are created through the word and the beauty and the harmony that we see in the created order is a reflection of that word who is in all and who enfolds all. At the same time, in the fullness of time, God sent his word and son into the world. The word took flesh and dwelt among us. The key point here is that Christ is God's word in the entirety of his person. And thus God's revelation is the person of Christ, not simply what Christ says. To see me, Christ says, is to see the Father. Christ then makes his significance manifest in a multiplicity of ways, through miracles, through his works, through his word and preaching, by the form of his death and resurrection. Dei Verbum goes on to argue that this gospel, proclaimed by all that Christ said and did, is known to us because arranged that this word would be handed on by the preaching and lives of the apostles and in the writings that the apostles were divinely inspired to undertake. The handing down of revelation through the life of the church and through the text of scripture written within it occurs under the aegis of the Spirit. The importance of this second point is that when we consider Scripture as Catholics, we must consider it in the wider context of the nature of Revelation as a whole. Scripture does not stand alone, but as a divinely ordered witness to God's revelation in Christ, and it stands within the nexus of ways in which the Father ensured that the gospel would be faithfully handed on. And here we come to the third of the three points I want to draw out of Dei Verbum. I mentioned that scripture and the church carries it forward, that carries it forward, were under the aegis of the Spirit. The same document is also clear that the text of the Spirit, quote, requires to be read and interpreted in the light of the same Spirit through whom it was written. This sentence is virtually taken word for word from Benedict XV's 1920 encyclical Spiritus Paracletus, 
And there, in turn, Benedict was simply quoting St. Jerome in the late 4th century. The principle articulated is a simple one, but with profound consequences. Just as the scriptures have their value through the work of the Spirit in enabling the formation of the earliest Christian community and the handing on of the faith in that community, so now, to understand these texts, we must be attentive to the ways in which the Spirit continues to order and sustain the Christian community, such that the faith may be handed on. This injunction then prescribes a series of objects for our attention if we are to be good readers of Scripture. It prescribes attention to the teaching of the Church as it has evolved under the guidance of the Spirit. It prescribes attention to the whole of the scriptural message. It prescribes also attention to the ways in which the Spirit has drawn out of the Christian community responses to the Gospel, responses that perform for us the meaning of the scripture in the lives of Christians. In these three principles, Dave Verbum summarizes much that is essential to a Catholic view of scripture and distinctive of it. In scripture, God speaks and speaks to us. God speaks to us in his word, that is, through the whole of the created order, primarily through the person of the incarnate word, and then through the written text which witnesses to that word. And third, scripture exists through the Spirit's action, the Spirit who guides the church towards its Lord. And to be read appropriately, the scripture must be read in the light of that same Spirit's presence. It is only in the light of these principles that De Verbum envisages Christians engaging in the techniques of modern biblical criticism. As I have hinted earlier, in the onrush of subsequent events after the Council, it is not always clear that Catholic biblical scholars did that well at this task for all the other advances that they made. And it is not at all clear that Catholic theologians articulated well how the gap between themselves and, and biblical scholars should be bridged. Now, the occupant of Peter's chair has rarely been a significant Catholic theologian, and that is as it should be. There are good reasons for that. You can ask me. But in the figure of Pope Benedict, we indeed had such a combination, and one who was deeply invested in the character of Catholic reading of Scripture. <coughs> Benedict stands in this lecture both as a symbol of the best of recent thinking on the relationship between scripture and tradition, and he was simply one of its architects. But rather than looking directly at how Benedict articulates these relations, most clearly in his 2010 text Verbum Domini, I want to turn first to Pope Francis's recent short document establishing the third Sunday in Ordinary Time as the Sunday of the Word of God. You can, of course, find both of the texts on the Vatican website. It is important to see that in this regard, Pope Francis quite consciously puts himself at the head of a chain, linking his text to Vatican II's De Verbum via Benedict's v v Verbum Domini. Toward the end of his short text, Francis draws attention to the work of the Spirit in a very distinctively Catholic fashion. Pointing back to the very sections of Dei Verbum that I have already mentioned, Francis emphasized that the Spirit is not only operative in the inspiring of Scripture, quote, it is also operative in those who hear the Word of God. And this is so when the Church teaches or interprets the Scriptures, and it is so when the believer makes these the norm of his or her spiritual life." Unquote. Paralleling this account of the Spirit's work, Francis begins his text by taking the appearance of Christ to the disciples on the road to Emmaus as describing a constitutive feature of Christian life. Christ appears to the disciples, he broke bread with them, and he opened to them the meaning of the Scriptures. As Luke tells us, he opened the scriptures 
by showing how Moses and the prophets pointed to him. Similarly, Francis says, and quite strikingly, quote, the relationship between the risen Lord, the community of believers, and sacred scripture is essential to our identity as Christians. And a little later he says, without the Lord who opens our mind to them, it is impossible to understand the scripture in any depth. The work of the Spirit in inspiring the community and the work of the risen Christ are here interwoven and often indistinguishable, the Spirit always enabling us to hear that which Christ speaks. Obviously enough, from the few sentences I've already quoted, Francis's account of the place of Scripture in Christian identity is an account of the whole Scripture. Not simply a part, he writes, but the whole of Scripture speaks of Christ. Francis's theology of Scripture is resolutely pastoral. It is aimed not at solving a problematic relationship between academic biblical scholars and theologians, but at showing how this text forms a part of Christian identity. He goes as far as to write, quote, The Bible is not a collection of history books or a chronicle. It is aimed entirely at the integral salvation of the person. It is, I would suggest, the strongly pastoral force of Francis's text that enables it to be so traditional, so easily to draw out the side of Dei Verbum that has, I am suggesting, been somewhat underdeveloped since the Council. In drawing on this side, Francis, wittingly or unwittingly, finds himself reaching back to offer us a quite distinctively Catholic theology of Scripture's place in our faith and life. And yet the problem with which I began remains. As I noted earlier, Dei Verbum both licenses, calls for and encourages a certain kind of historical critical concern with the text of Scripture, even as it also upholds a clearly Catholic view of Scripture's nature. Because the Council espouses both perspectives, it is our task to work out ways of doing so too. Indeed, you'll remember that I have been suggesting the time is peculiarly opportune for us to do so. And thus, we should now turn to Francis' predecessor. In his 2010 um, text, Verbum Domini, Benedict offers a fuller account of Scripture's place in the lives and faith of Christians than Francis, and much more text. But he also offers us one that spends considerable time thinking about the relationship between modern scholarly approaches and what theologians want to say about the place of Scripture. At the heart of his text, Benedict offers not so much a fully formed argument, but a sketch of the conversations that are necessary for us and for the next generation of Catholic theology. Allow me to set out three aspects of the conversation that Benedict recommends to us. The first aspect consists of a both and essential to good Catholic thought about Scripture. We must certainly acknowledge, Benedict says, the mighty advances made possible by modern historical scholarship and the necessity of such work. Simply put, we believe that God chose to speak in a particular people, time and idiom. And so learning what we may of that people, time and idiom cannot but be good for us. At the same time, it is essential that Catholic exegetes devote themselves to such study and are also aware of the philosophical and theological commitments essential to Catholic identity. Philosophically, he says, it is essential that biblical scholars pay attention to what they presume about the nature of historical events. Do they still uphold the possibility of divine action alongside human action? Do they still uphold the possibility that an expression in a particular cultural form may speak across the ages under the Spirit's guidance. The task for experts here is not to be less historical, but to be more philosophically attentive 
in their work. Now, theologically, Benedict points to the need for Catholic exegetes to recognize a number of basic principles concerning the place of scripture in Catholic thought. First, Benedict mentions the importance of Catholic exegetes remembering that what they are trying to exegete is the word of God. Their common task is achieved and this goal reached only when the text's meaning for the church today is explained. And there, once again, we see the close link between accepting that God speaks in this text and the insistence that the interpretation of what God says to us today must be a key exegetical goal. This is not to say that all exegetes must on every occasion provide us with such a clear message. It is that all exegetes need to know that this is the direction of their work, the purpose of the conversation of which they are a part. Another key way in which Benedict puts this point is to insist that scholarly reading and Lexio Divina should not be understood as separated by a profound gulf. Catholic scholars should read the text with the same ends in view as those who pray the text. Our goal is to hear how God speaks to us now. The second basic truth that Catholic readers of the scripture must recognize is that any one passage we read fits within the whole. Scripture is a unity and grasping that whole is a key foundation for good reading of any part. One of the most striking ways in which Benedict draws this principle out is through speaking not only of the importance of understanding how to read the text of scripture according to its multiple senses, recognizing that reading allegorically, for example, is a strategy which meditates upon the text in ways that draw us towards the truths that scripture as a whole reveals. Benedict speaks not only of understanding such modes of reading, that's striking enough, but also of recognizing that, quote, it is essential to grasp the passage from the letter to the spirit. The letter needs to be transcended. By this tri striking statement, Benedict suggests that a Catholic reader must know that the reading of any passage must move toward or be open to moving toward a reading of the whole gospel, and hence toward awareness of the paschal mystery that is the central reality of Christian life. The third truth on which Benedict insists is not solely for the Catholic exegete in the sense of the Catholic scholarly student of the scriptures, but, the, but for the Catholic exegete, whether Bible scholar, theologian, or purely, purely and simply the Catholic reader of scripture. This truth is that the privileged setting in which the word of God speaks to us is in the liturgy, and hence the privileged setting for the interpretation of the written word is also the liturgy. The relationship between scripture and liturgy may be reduced for our purposes this evening to two points. First, the manner in which the liturgy is steeped in, imbued with scripture, shows us at each mass the interrelationship of the parts of the whole scripture. The progress from Old to New Testament is shown in the order of readings. The use of scriptural language in collects, prefaces, creeds, all reveal to us how the elements of scripture should be drawn together in our imagination so that they come to constitute a unified language for us to speak of history and of our own histories toward God. Second, there is an intrinsic link between the text of Scripture and the Eucharist itself. The central message of the Scriptures culminates in Christ's offering of himself and his incorporation of us into his body. At the height of the Eucharistic liturgy, that sacrifice is present as is our incorporation into it. Participation in the Eucharist may thus bring home to us the true meaning of Scripture and the recognition that in the elements Christ is truly present may enable us to recognize the, my the mystical 
quasi-sacramental character of the reading and hearing of God's word. Thus, to recap, Benedict offers a series of philosophical and theological pointers to exegetes and theologians, if they are to understand themselves as Catholic exegetes and theologians. Among the philosophical, I highlighted the importance of reflective attention to how we understand the nature of historical events and texts. Theologically, I emphasized remembering that scripture is the word of God to us now, recognizing that any one passage must be read also within the whole, and recognizing that the liturgy is the privileged place for hearing and reading the scripture. Benedict offers these prescriptions, as I said a while ago, at an auspicious moment in the history of Catholic interpretation. And he does so by bringing out a deeply traditional and Catholic view of scripture into dialogue with the best that modern historical technique has to offer. If Dei Verbum represents a f one fundamental stage in this process, placing side by side the demands of a Catholic view of the scriptures with the emphases of modern biblical criticism, and if the half century since saw something of an increasing bifurcation between the practice of Catholic biblical scholars and the demands of Catholic faith, then Benedict and Francis represent a sign that the time is now ripe for a new path toward rapprochement and as a result not abandoning but deepening the Catholic view of scripture. Now it will seem already as if I am actually going to spend all of my time speaking about the place of Scripture, especially over the last 50 years, as if little is going to be said about questions of tradition. From one perspective, this is certainly not true, because of the very manner in which I described the event of Revelation following the Second Vatican Council's Dei Verbum. When I introduced that text, I emphasized that not only, is, not only is Christ God's revelation to us in all that he did and taught, but also that the passing on of revelation, the act of traditio in Latin, handing on or tradition in English, occurs under the guidance of the Spirit. The apostles pass on the gospel and all that they have learned from Christ through the work of the Spirit, and through the work of the Spirit, some are driven to write under the Spirit's guidance, and thus we have the Scriptures. By focusing on this complex matrix, matrix from which flow both our Scriptures and the Church, we can see that at its root, why tradition, understood as the act of handing on and the Scriptures, together are the one source of faith that Dei Verbum insists they are. The idea that tradition names primarily an act may be unfamiliar if you are accustomed to thinking of tradition as primarily stuff that is handed on. To make this a little clearer, I want to spend my final few minutes taking up what I see as the invitation in Benedict's Verbum Domini to Christian thinkers to explore ways of holding together all that he sees as essential in the development of a Catholic theology of the scriptures for our day. In a number of recent articles, I have suggested that one key way in which we might better imagine the role of the scriptures in the life of the church is to reflect a little more consciously on the plurality of scripture's literal sense, on the manner in which the meaning of the text is discovered over time. <coughs> One of the striking facilities that modern biblical scholarship has granted us over the past couple of hundred years is the ability to see in increasing depth how particular biblical themes and language might have resonated to their first audiences. Of course, there is great debate among different schools of biblical scholars about particular interpretations of particular texts. And such disputes are simply the stuff of all serious investigation of texts. And yet even given these debates, 
new awareness of the possible res resonances of biblical expressions has opened up and in many ways made more visible the world in which Christ taught. In the same way, increasing historical sophistication since the Renaissance in our historiographical techniques has made us far more conscious of ways in which earlier language becomes co-opted into new service. Thus, for example, when we confess in the Nicene Creed that God's word was begotten, not created, we are using terms that the authors of the creed consciously drew from scripture. And yet a little historical investigation will reveal that the scriptural writers probably did not themselves intend to mark precisely that clear division when they used those terms. And early Christian writers before the Creed of Nicaea interpreted those terms in a range of different ways. And yet it would, I suggest, be a failure of the Catholic imagination just to say that we, hence, cannot recognize the creed's distinction between begotten and created as good exegesis. Rather, what we can now see very clearly is the manner in which the riches and mysteriousness of the scriptural text are drawn out over time. In this case, for example, it is surely fine for us to explore the manner in which these terms might have been heard in the first and second centuries, and to acknowledge the difference from how they are heard in the controversies around and before the Nicene Creed. At the same time, we can also, we must explore, without excessive romanticism or wishful thinking, the manner in which Nicaea was the marking of an absolute distinction between the act of creation and the eternal begetting of God's word, and that this marking drew on, amplified, and brought out key themes that are hidden within the whole of the message of the New Testament. Recognition of the emergence of scriptural readings that then become important within the church's teaching should surely become central to how we teach the character and place of scripture in Catholic theology. Nor is this opening of the history of scriptural interpretation a giving way to relativism. In the first place, it is not because the church speaks with authority and through the spirit is provided with the means to securely guide our path through the riches of the scriptural text. In the second place, even when multiple readings of the text persist and remain the subject of debate, some will always be more plausible than others. The very form of texts shape and guide what may be plausibly said about them. Now, to advocate for a clearer acceptance of the emergence of biblical meaning over time brings us back round to the significance of tradition. Tradition, as I have already hinted, is a concept that must be viewed from two angles. From one angle, the most obvious angle, tradition refers to that which is handed down. But fundamentally, tradition is also an act, the act of handing on. And Christians hand on their faith well insofar as they are attentive to the work of the risen Christ and his spirit among them. Tradition as an act is rooted in patterns of Christian attention to the work of God among us. Attention to tradition and the act of tradition is almost a Christian imagination, a Christian sensibility. The emphasis that I place on tradition as an act of response or as a Christian form of attention is drawn from a strain of reflection on tradition that stems back through a line of French reflection in such figures as Maurice Blondel and Yves Congar, but it finds its roots deep in the early 19th century. The figure of Félix Ravesson is another important influence. If you've not read his little book on habit, you should do so. When we consider the history of tradition as the unfolding of the gospel's meaning over time, we are considering a history of humanity's response to the work of Christ and the Spirit in the Church. Part of this response occurs at an official level 
the many doctrinal formally that formulae that flow from the church's councils over the centuries are such responses but so also are the lives of the saints the performances of response that continue to inspire Christians today the history of the church's dogmatic teaching its gradual discovering of how we can best teach the mystery of God's action in Christ witnesses to the guided acts of discernment through which the church speaks Similarly, the lives of the great saints, an Augustine, a Thomas, or a John Henry Newman, similarly witness to the many ways in which Christian res Christians may respond to the Spirit's work among them. It is easy enough to get into a debate with curious non-Catholics about whether Catholics believe in the indispensability of beliefs or practices that are conveyed to us only by tradition rather than scripture. We've been doing this since the Reformation. But such debates are not always pointless, but I do suspect they are almost always fruitless unless they find themselves being at root debates about what scripture is and about what tradition is. We might say that scripture is an essential part of the manner in which God reveals and redeems us through drawing us into the interchange and mutual work of Son and Spirit. Allow me to repeat this sentence and show how it encapsulates much of what I have said so far. Scripture is an essential part of the manner in which God reveals and redeems us through drawing us into the interchange and mutual work of Son and Spirit. Earlier, I highlighted Dave Verbum's emphasis on the multiple ways in which the Word of God speaks, in creation, in the person of Jesus Christ, and through the means by which the Gospel is handed on. Those who hand on the Gospel, the Apostles and Gospel writers, are drawn into the, into the Father's proclamation of the Gospel. Those who begin to respond to that call through the assistance of the Spirit are part of the divinely ordered answer to the divine Word that has been spoken. Both speaker and those who answer are drawn into the witness of the Spirit to the Son. They are drawn into the relationship between Son and Spirit. Scripture and the response of Christians to it are both part of this, are both part of this divine relationship into which we are drawn. One sometimes hears the apologetic argument that tradition and church precede Scripture. Scripture emerges in the church and is authorised by it. Therefore, Protestants are wrong. The argument is not without force. It's always fun to bring it out. But it is also one that needs supplementing with a clearly theological account of Revelation and its reception. And that you find best, I think, in recent debates in De Verbum's account supplemented by Benedict's Verbum Domini. And thus we can supplement the statement I offered a few minutes ago. If scripture is an essential part of the manner in which God reveals and redeems us, tradition, understood as the act of handing on, as a work of the Spirit, making clear and drawing out the riches of the mystery of the Gospel, in scripture, is scripture's natural and divinely given counterpart and context. What used to be termed the monuments of tradition, the texts and statements that the church holds up before us, are witnesses to those moments of discernment and response that the Spirit has called forth from Christ's body. And so are the lives of the saints held out to us in the church's memory. Now, it is very easy to get carried away by high theological rhetoric. It's how I make my money. But you will remember that I began this talk with a tension between the, d the direction of much Catholic biblical scholarship since the Council and a theologically informed view of the meaning of scripture and tradition. Luckily, or so I claimed, we lived in promising times when the increasing diversity among biblical scholars may meet with new and powerful reassertions of the Second Vatican Council's teaching on Revelation to form a new synthesis. Yet. In the last place, 
The problem is not only one for biblical scholars. It is also one for theologians and historians of theology who have tended to fight shy of direct engagement with the biblical text. At the same time, this problem cannot only be solved by wishing it away. The directions of which I spoke have become institutionalized in the very way we train younger theologians and in the way we organize our faculties of theology. The question then that faces all who look to the future of Catholic theology, especially those who look to uphold a traditional view of scripture and tradition, is to begin envisaging anew the very shape of the training of theologians and the ways in which theology and scripture are taught. It will require a huge act of the theological and institutional imagination to make it happen. But it is, I think, essential if we are to promote the view of scripture and tradition recorded at Vatican II and apparent in recent papal teaching. And yet, let us not place too much in our own self-belief. We are not the only agents working for the proclamation of the gospel. That has been an essential part of my point. And if nothing else, we should have faith in that. What is it that you should take away from this evening? Perhaps Pope Benedict's pithy and yet striking statement in Verbum Domini. Christianity, he says, is not a religion of the book. It is a religion of the word. The word that God speaks and the spirit that God breathes enfold all that I have spoken about this evening. The Father speaks his word and enables us to respond to that word. The Spirit aids the word speaking among us through inspiring the apostles, apostles to write, and the Spirit draws from us a response to that written word. Ours is not a religion of the book, but a religion of the word, a history and a community enfolded by the action of Son and Spirit. Thank you. Um, I think this is sort of off the topic. So this is one of those things that if I had more self-control, I would not have said. But it, it becomes a sort of Catholic, it's become a Catholic principle, I think, with such charismatic figures as John Paul II and Benedict XVI, although all sorts of people thought that Benedict wouldn't be charismatic, but he obviously is. Um, it's become a sort of assumption that the Pope is the chief Catholic theologian. Um, and I think that's actually an error when one looks at the long history of the papal office, very few popes have been theologians. And that's because the pope's role is to keep the, th the, sh the ship running, to say no at important points, to call councils when required, rather than to be the chief spokesman. Um, and I think it's good that we have a few major Catholic theologians who are simply popes. And I think you actually get a sense of this in some of Benedict's writings, in which he's trying to distinguish his own opinions from the teaching of the church. He recognises, quite interestingly, I think, that he's got to the point where uh, everything he said comes to be reported in newspapers as what the church says. And so he goes to great lengths in some of his writings to say, this is my opinion, this is not what the church says. That's a rather complex message that newspapers don't get. So I'm not certain that popes should, be good, should necessarily be good theologians. Perhaps the weakness of modern biblical scholarship is that it has become a religion of the book. <laughs> Well, it might be. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, th I, think the, I think actually the reason here for turning to, um, uh, turning to Benedict is because he is struggling with the need for two things at once, and I think that's rather important. It would be very easy to say, well, historical, critical, biblical scholarship is a bad idea, so let's not do it. Um, but I think that would be deeply mistaken. That's not to see that providentially uh, modernity in many ways offers resources that are not simply a challenge to Catholicism but something to be embraced. Um, if they need to be embraced and retooled at the same time, 
Uh, that's, that's just part of the work that's ours. Um, and so Benedict, I think, is trying to maintain the importance of a, of a truly, plausibly historical scholarship, but one that also is attentive to questions like, um, does my practice presume somehow that God can no longer act, such that it's no longer open to having a theological reading? So he's trying to do both of those things at once, and I think that's, that's deeply important. And it's deeply important that, that Benedict, in some ways, does not have a, a solution to this, because these are deeply complex philosophical questions as well as theological questions. And I think when you look at a work like his uh, Jesus of Nazareth, um, you know, the book that he wanted to write until rudely interrupted by being made Pope, um, you see there him trying to put side by side different forms of exegesis. So he'll be talking... Um, about some reasonably up-to-date scholarship on the Jewish background to an aspect of the New Testament. And then suddenly, he's talking about a patristic reading of the text and, and trying to see how they, they fit together. And I think that's actually extremely fruitful. And maybe someone will do that differently in a different generation. But I think he is trying to take seriously the importance of bringing the two together, but without Catholic biblical scholarship becoming divorced from... Catholic theology, or Catholic theology becoming uninterested in what the Bible scholars are doing, which I think has become a very problematic relationship. Yeah, it's a long answer to say yes. So to, I, I probably won't become like a great theologian, so if I'm kind of trying to go throughout with like <laughs> praying with the Bible more, but being aware of um, more of the history and like the background that we have, is there like a good resource you would recommend for that? That's actually a really good question. I mean, both, both in terms of the average Catholic reader and in terms of the biblical scholar, we have, uh, I think, a difficult problem whereby if uh, a student says to me, well, what can I read on the exegesis, say, of John's Gospel that will show me the best of what modern biblical scholarship is doing about reconstructing that text in its original context and the history of its interpretation. I can't point to a book. What I can do is say, well, you should read a bit of this. Okay, you should read uh, some of Thomas's commentary on John. You should read some of Augustine's homilies on John. Uh, you should go and read the following biblical commentaries. And you have to put it together. And I think the fact that I would have to say that is in part a reflection of how we divide up the subject at the moment. So we don't have unified resources which really try to bring things together well. Um, so it's actually very difficult to answer that question. Um, what you have to do is to develop habits, okay, um, in which when you're seeking to understand a text, you know that you have multiple duties. You know, one of your duties is to go and look at a couple of decent commentaries. Another of your duties is to ask around, not Wikipedia, but ask around and find uh, who in the patristic and medieval period produced the best commentaries on this text. Go and try and read some of them so that you're looking at multiple viewpoints on that text. Uh, and I think that, as a very simple and basic habit, begins to break down the boundaries uh, a little. And that's perhaps, at this moment, the best we can do. We can only do little bits. Accessibility yeah. of, of scripture. Yeah. Mm. I mean, there is a real... The, the one problem is fundamentalism. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just taking it as you find the words. Yeah. And the other is this kind of scholarship that you were, you were yeah, yeah. talking about here. But in between are lots of people don't have the time to mm -hmm. check out all these commentaries or yeah. the information. What can, one, what can one do to, to encourage going deeper and yet um, not being excessively demanded? The best thing one can do, I think, is to read the text regularly. Um, one of the real differences, I think, 
Um, and, and I see it as a, as a teacher between students now and even when I started teaching you know, not quite 30 years ago, is a lack of basic biblical knowledge. And one of the real difficulties in understanding the New Testament is seeing how much and how deeply it's a commentary on the old. And the, the only and best way to um, remedy that problem is to read it. <laughs> um, and I think there's a sense in which a- any basic study Bible will point you towards the Old Testament references and passages that link together uh, New and Old Testaments. And I think the slow meditative reading of passages of the New Testament coupled with a careful looking at the passages in the Old that are being drawn on and commented, especially when it's the, when it's the Psalms. Um, I think that's particularly fruitful. But also, obviously, the prophetic books. But trying to get a sense of the depth of the text is something that we can all do by slow and careful reading that has uh, huge implications. And I think that sort of reading also then makes it more possible as one becomes more familiar with biblical language and idiom to appreciate the way that the the text of the liturgy is so deeply imbued with scriptural language. And I think simply becoming more imbued with scriptural language is itself uh, a worthy and significant goal. Not everyone needs to rush to the library to, to get out commentaries. But everyone can slowly become more aware of the relationships between Old and New Testaments and the depth of what is being spoken about in the New. That would be another way of taking this forward, I think. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I, um, I've actually found myself quite involved in debate with um, uh, American evangelicals of various kinds. Um, I, I think there has been a sort of uh, greater ecumenical openness that is not born simply of common liberalism. None of us believe anything anymore, so let's get together. But a sort of openness, uh, there is such ecumenism, I won't, no, I didn't say that, no. Um, But there there is, I think, in the past 20 or 30 years, much more um, discussion that occurs between certain kinds of Catholic writers and evangelical writers, recognizing that there's a common sense of the value of scripture. Uh, Evangelicals, I think, in many quarters have come to be interested in tradition in new ways. So you can have now, I think, often I find myself speaking in um, small, smaller Protestant colleges and seminaries, and people are genuinely interested, not for us to come to an agreement that day, but to hear what it is that Catholics actually believe and why, and then think, hmm, well that's different from us, but we feel enough common cause, we can have a useful discussion about it. And I think there's a sort of um, ecumenism in there that is well, in those conversations that's actually very positive and very helpful. Um, you know, do I think that I'm traveling to, you know, whatever the East Kentucky Baptist Seminary uh, in order to convert everyone who's there? Um, well, I do if I've had a couple of drinks, I suppose. But in reality, I know that's not what I'm doing. What I'm going to do there is to explain clearly what it is that Catholics believe and why and how it fits together. 
So I might give a talk on tradition where I say, no, no, you are only thinking about tradition in this sense. We must think about it in this wider sense. And they will be genuinely interested because it's a firmly theological opinion. It's one in which I can show, um, you know, has many forebears they're interested in and it's rooted in, in what scripture itself says. And we can have a very useful discussion. Who knows where that will lead? But that may not, that's not really up to me and that's not really our problem. So I think there is a dialogue that's really come to be quite important. Um, and you see a number of uh, evangelical writers um, trying to think now about the value of tradition as the context within scripture is read and understood. And that's a, that's a huge shift and a really interesting one. And it, and it has led, I think, to really interesting conversations over the past 20 or 30 years. A lot of them originating uh, in the US. The whole uh, Catholics and Evangelicals Together movement, which has a lot of conferences and a lot of interesting discussions, has been a very, very good thing for everybody. Thank you very much.